The Unrest Cure Written by Saki The pen name of Hector Hugh Monroe Narrated by Michael Anthony Scott Produced by Thought Audio On the rack in the railway carriage, immediately opposite Clovis, was a solidly wrought traveling bag with a carefully written label on which was inscribed J.P. Huddle, The Warren, Tilfield, near Slowborough. Immediately below the rack sit the human embodiment of the label, a solid, sedate individual, sedately dressed, sedately conversational. Even without his conversation, which was addressed to a friend seated by his side and touched chiefly on such topics as the backwardness of Roman hyacinths and the prevalence of measles at the rectory, one could have gauged fairly accurately the temperament and mental outlook of the traveling bag's owner. But he seemed unwilling to leave anything to the imagination of a casual observer, and his talk grew presently personal and introspective. I don't know why it is, he told his friend. I'm not much over 40, but I seem to have settled down into a deep groove of elderly middle age. My sister shows the same tendency. We like everything to be exactly in its accustomed place. We like things to happen exactly at their appointed times. We like everything to be usual, orderly, punctual, methodical, to a hair's breadth, to a minute. It distresses and upsets us if it is not so. For instance, to take a very trifling matter, a thrush has built its nest year after year in the catkin tree on the lawn. This year, for no obvious reason, it is building in the ivy on the garden wall. We have said very little about it, but I think we both feel that the change is unnecessary and just a little irritating. Perhaps, said the friend, it is a different thrush. We have suspected that, said J.P. Huddle, and I think it gives us even more cause for annoyance. We don't feel that we want a change of thrush at our time of life, and yet, as I have said, we have scarcely reached an age when these things should make themselves seriously felt. What you want, said the friend, is an unrest cure. An unrest cure? I've never heard of such a thing. You've heard of rest cures for people who've broken down under stress of too much worry and strenuous living. Well, you're suffering from too much repose and placidity, and you need the opposite kind of treatment. But where would one go for such a thing? Well, you might stand as an orange candidate for Kilkenny, or do a course of district visiting in one of the Apache quarters of Paris, or give lectures in Berlin to prove that most of Wagner's music was written by Gambetti, and there's always the interior of Morocco to travel in. But to be really effective, the unrest cure ought to be tried in the home. How you do it, I haven't the faintest idea. It was at this point in the conversation that Clovis became galvanized into alert attention. After all, his two days' visit to an elderly relative at Slowborough did not promise much excitement. Before the train had stopped, he had decorated his sinister shirt cuff with the inscription of J.P. Huddle, the Warren, Tilfield, near Slowborough. Two mornings later, Mr. Huddle broke in on his sister's privacy as she sat reading Country Life in the morning room. It was her day and hour and place for reading Country Life, and the intrusion was absolutely irregular, but he bore in his hand a telegram, and in that household telegrams were recognized as happening by the hand of God. This particular telegram partook of the nature of a thunderbolt. Bishop examining confirmation class in neighborhood, unable to stay at rectory on account of measles, invokes your hospitality, sending secretary to arrange. I scarcely know the bishop. I've only spoken to him once, exclaimed J.P. Huddle, with the exculpating air of one who realizes too late the indiscretion of speaking to strange bishops. Miss Huddle was the first to rally. She dislikes thunderbolts as fervently as her brother did, but the womanly instinct in her told her that thunderbolts must be fed. We can curry the cold duck, she said. It was not the appointed day for curry, 
but the little orange envelope involved a certain departure from rule and custom. Her brother said nothing, but his eyes thanked her for being brave. A young gentleman to see you announced the parlor maid. The secretary murmured the huddles in unison. They instantly stiffened into a demeanor which proclaimed that, though they held all strangers to be guilty, they were willing to hear anything they might have to say in their defense. The young gentleman, who came into the room with a certain elegant haughtiness, was not at all Huddle's idea of a bishop's secretary. He had not supposed that the Episcopal establishment could have afforded such an expensively upholstered article when there were so many other claims on its resources. The face was fleetingly familiar. If he had bestowed more attention on the fellow traveler sitting opposite him in the railway carriage two days before, he might have recognized Clovis in his present visitor. You are the bishop's secretary, asked Huddle, becoming consciously deferential. His confidential secretary answered Clovis. You may call me Stanislaus. My other name doesn't matter. The bishop and Colonel Alberti may be here to lunch. I shall be here in any case. It sounded rather like the program of a royal visit. The bishop is examining a confirmation class in the neighborhood, isn't he? asked Miss Huddle. Ostensibly, was the dark reply, followed by a request for a large-scale map of the locality. Clovis was still immersed in a seemingly profound study of the map when another telegram arrived. It was addressed to Prince Stanislaus, care of Huddle, the Warren, etc. Clovis glanced at the contents and announced, The Bishop and Alberti won't be here till late in the afternoon. Then he returned to a scrutiny of the map. The luncheon was not a very festive function. The princely secretary ate and drank with fair appetite, but severely discouraged conversation. At the finish of the meal, he broke suddenly into a radiant smile, thanked his hostess for a charming repast, and kissed her hand with deferential rapture. Miss Huddle was unable to decide in her mind whether the action savored of Luis Cortesonian courtliness or the reprehensible Roman attitude towards the Sabine women. It was not her day for having a headache, but she felt that the circumstances excused her and retired to her room to have as much headache as was possible before the bishop's arrival. Clovis, having asked the way to the nearest telegraph office, disappeared presently down the carriage drive. Mr. Huddle met him in the hall some two hours later and asked when the bishop would arrive. He's in the library with Alberti, was the reply. But why wasn't I told? I never knew he had come, exclaimed Huddle. No one knows he is here, said Clovis. The quieter we can keep matters, the better. And on no account disturb him in the library. Those are his orders. But what is all this mystery about? And who is Alberti? And isn't the bishop going to have tea? The bishop is out for blood, not tea. Blood gasped Tuttle, who did not find that the thunderbolt improved on acquaintance. Tonight is going to be a great night in the history of Christendom, said Clovis. We are going to massacre every Jew in the neighborhood. To massacre the Jews, said Huddle indignantly. Do you mean to tell me there's a general rising against them? No, it's the bishop's own idea. He's in there arranging all the details now. But the bishop is such a tolerant, humane man. That is precisely what will heighten the effect of his action. The sensation will be enormous. That at least Huddle could believe. He will be hanged, he exclaimed with conviction. A motor is waiting to carry him to the coast, where a steam yacht is in readiness. But there aren't thirty Jews in the whole neighborhood, protested Huddle, whose brain, under the repeated shocks of the day, was operating with the uncertainty of a telegraph wire during earthquake disturbances. We have twenty-six on our list, said Clovis, referring to a bundle of notes. We shall be able to deal with them all the more thoroughly. Do you mean to tell me that you are meditating violence against a man like Sir Leon Burberry, stammered Huddle. He's one of the most respected men in the country. He's down on our list, said Clovis carelessly. After all, we've got men we can trust to do our job, so we shan't have to rely on local assistance. 
and we've got some Boy Scouts helping us as auxiliaries. Boy Scouts? Yes. When they understood there was real killing to be done, they were even keener than the men. This thing will be a blot on the 20th century, and your house will be the blotting pad. Have you realized that half the papers of Europe and the United States will publish pictures of it? By the way, I've sent some photographs of you and your sister that I found in the library to the Matin and de Walsh. I hope you don't mind. Also, a sketch of the staircase. Most of the killing will probably be done on the staircase. The emotions that were surging in J.P. Huddle's brain were almost too intense to be disclosed in speech, but he managed to gasp out. There aren't any Jews in this house. Not at present, said Clovis. I shall go to the police, shouted Huddle with sudden energy. In the shrubbery, said Clovis, are posted ten men who have orders to fire on anyone who leaves the house without my signal of permission. Another armed guard is in ambush near the front gate. The Boy Scouts watch the back premises. At this moment, the cheerful hoot of a motor horn was heard from the drive. Huddle rushed to the hall door with the feeling of a man half awakened from a nightmare and beheld Sir Leon Burberry, who had driven himself over in his car. I got your telegram, he said. What's up? Telegram? It seemed to be a day of telegrams. Come here at once. Urgent. James Huddle was the purport of the message displayed before Huddle's bewildered eyes. I see it all, he exclaimed suddenly, in a voice shaken with agitation, and with a look of agony in the direction of the shrubbery, he hauled the astonished Burberry into the house. Tea had just been laid in the hall but the now thoroughly panic-stricken Huddle dragged his protesting guest upstairs, and in a few minutes' time, the entire household had been summoned to that region of momentary safety. Clovis alone graced the tea table with his presence. The fanatics in the library were evidently too immersed in their monstrous machinations to dally with the solace of teacup and hot toast. Once the youth rose, in answer to the summons of the front doorbell, and admitted Mr. Paul Isaacs, shoemaker and parish counselor, who had also received a pressing invitation to the Warren. With an atrocious assumption of courtesy, which a Borgia could hardly have outdone, the secretary escorted this new captive of his net to the head of the stairway, where his involuntary host awaited him. And then ensued a long, ghastly vigil of watching and waiting. Once or twice, Clovis left the house to stroll across to the shrubbery, returning always to the library for the purpose, evidently, of making a brief report. Once he took in the letters from the evening postman and brought them to the top of the stairs with punctilious politeness. After his next absence, he came halfway up the stairs to make an announcement. The Boy Scouts mistook my signal and have killed the postman. I've had very little practice in this sort of thing, you see. Another time I shall do better. The housemaid, who was engaged to be married to the evening postman, gave way to clamorous grief. Remember that your mistress has a headache, said J.P. Huddle. Miss Huddle's headache was worse. Clovis hastened downstairs, and after a short visit to the library, returned with another message. The bishop is sorry to hear that Miss Huddle has a headache. He is issuing orders that as far as possible, no firearms shall be used near the house. Any killing that is necessary on the premises will be done with cold steel. The bishop does not see why a man should not be a gentleman as well as a Christian. That was the last they saw of Clovis. It was nearly seven o'clock, and his elderly relative liked him to dress for dinner. But though he had left them forever, the lurking suggestion of his presence haunted the lower regions of the house during the long hours of the wakeful night, and every creak of the stairway, every rustle of wind through the shrubbery, was fraught with horrible meaning. At about seven the next morning, the gardener's boy and the early postman finally convinced the watchers that the twentieth century was still unblotted. I don't suppose, mused Clovis, as an early train bore him townwards that they will be in the least grateful for the unrest cure.